welcome everybody back uh, as we continue this, uh, you know, space traffic management conference. So this session is basically about, uh, you know, orbital lifetime, active debris removal, disposal, uh, you know, demise of, of these space objects and that sort of thing. So we have a great cast of folks uh, in this session. And what I've asked uh, them to do is just give a two to three minute summary uh, just to refresh our minds and then we can go into uh, questions. So with that, uh, in, in, in the list that I see uh, on the agenda, let's start with Catherine, please. Thank you, Mariba. Uh, I'm Catherine uh, Dolvidina, legal counsel of uh, the Italian new space company called uh, Diorbit. Uh, my paper uh, in co-authorship with some of my colleagues uh, is uh, called the case for no waste, uh, the approach uh, for Europe to facilitate uh, um, setting the requirements uh, for satellites to have uh, autonomous decommissioning devices from the perspective of uh, procuring space assets by European uh, institutions. Uh, we focus uh, on in our paper on um, the regulatory framework that exists on the European Union level for uh, procure, procuring uh, not only space uh, assets, but also procuring uh, procurement principles in general. And based on the uh, existing uh, goals and needs of the European Union as uh, manifested in various policy and regulatory uh, documents, uh, we distill that uh, a requirement for satellites to have an autonomous uh, decommissioning device uh, is actually in line with a lot of uh, existing and applicable and implementable procurement principles that exist in Europe. And uh, in the paper, we suggest that this procuring model should be established at least uh, as a starter, so to say, to uh, procure uh, satellites uh, on, by the European institutions, for example, within the European Space Program that hopefully will be adopted this year on the uh, regulation uh, level and will then kickstart. And then uh, by this exercise to set standards uh, for the industry and kind of distill this uh, uh, government uh, procurement uh, principles and practices to the industry standard and the market standard by uh, then uh, adopting and uh, uptaking uh, the decommissioning technology uh, for uh, future European uh, satellites uh, in any market, not just institutional. So that's in a nutshell. All right, very thank you, Catherine. All right, Siwo. Oh, uh, yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Siwo Kim, a graduate student of KAIST in South Korea. I uploaded my work about the orbital lifetime analysis of Leo constellation. And as you know, the recent surge in the number of satellites in Leo, which primarily caused by mega constellations such as Starlink. Uh, raises significant concerns about the increasing of the collision risk between space objects. So for long-term sustain sustainability of the space, it is critical to develop a disposal strategy, which should be based on an accurate assessment of their orbital lifetime. So to do this, a uh, high fidelity orbit propagator is constructed through this study. And the case study performed using the propagator with Starlink satellites. And, and the orbit propagator constructed here is based on the ORCID, which is a free low-level space dynamic library. And the dormant Prince integrator, which is based on Lungekuta 8 order algorithm, is used to solve ODE. And the four main perturbations in Leo region, which is gravity field of uh, central body and atmospheric drag, third body perturbations, 
due to the sun and the moon and the solar radiation pressure were modeled. And in case study, the impact of the perturbation model is shown by differentiating the density model, which is the most dominant perturbing, perturbing force in real vision. And also the lifetime difference under the different orbital parameter among starting constellation, which now uh, consists with five different orbit parameters. And the effect of space weather is also uh, demonstrated. And based on this work, I'm now considering the parallel computing method to overcome the computational disadvantages of the high fidelity method. And I wish and it will be used for further discussion and could supporting the disposal strategy and some new regulation for mega constellation. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siwoo. Uh, my brother, Hugh. Thanks, Mariba. Um, nice to see everybody and uh, to see everybody well as well. Um, so I'm Hugh Lewis from the University of Southampton in the UK. Uh, the, the paper I um, uh, presented to this conference is, is really the first beginnings of, of an exploration into two issues related to time when you're looking at space sustainability. First one is that many of the objects in orbit, uh, they're going to be in orbit for a very, very long time, uh, potentially thousands or tens of thousands of years. So consideration of the environment and space sustainability really does need to consider those objects. But at the same time, when we're trying to understand the impact of uh, current space activities, uh, and in particular events uh, such as collisions and, and fragmentation events, then we also need to understand things that occur at the other end of the, the time scale uh, that, that take place in, in microseconds. And at the moment, um, that, you know, my feeling is, is our understanding of, of both of those uh, ends of, the, of that spectrum is actually quite poor. Um, and we need to do a better job. So the paper is really introducing that as a problem and then also um, starting to introduce some ideas uh, around computer models that we could use to start to investigate those particular aspects. Thanks, Marita. Thank you very much, Hugh. Outstanding. Miles. Thanks, I'm Miles Lipson. I'm a doctoral student with the Astrodynamics Space Robotics and Controls Laboratory at MIT. And my paper is really about how we can try and get from where we are to a future with widespread active to removal service being available. There's, I think, two main kinds of programs you can use to help guess towards that future. Uh, push programs where you're subsidizing inputs to research and pull programs where you subsidize the outputs of research. And I think that thus far, the US has mainly focused on push programs. And I argue that there's probably a need for pull programs as well. And that there's a program design known as an advanced market commitment that was developed by the global health community for vaccination in low income countries to address two key problems that also apply here. The first is there are a lot of positive externalities which lead to under purchasing of the good or active debris removal service in this case. And then secondly, also that because there's low willingness to pay, although critically non-zero, um, it's also hard to make a market case and people are more reluctant to get into it. So we think the advanced market commitment concept could help address both of these problems and lead to a potentially promising program to help guests towards a world with commercialized ADR services. Excellent, Miles. Thank you very much. And then Sean. Hi, my name is Sean Nolan. I'm from Orbit Guardians and uh, just like Miles, I'm trying to get some economy behind uh, ADR, looking for some way to fund ADR. So we're, we're revitalizing the, the concept uh, brought up by George Long before of tax credits. And in discussions with Mariba, um, we talked about what can you do to, to figure out what is really a good ADR project. And we talked a little bit about how windmills were funded in the beginning um, through kilowatt hour subsidies. And so we tried to put together something like a kilowatt hour subsidy for ADR. And it looks at the footprint of each object in space. And it looks at orbital carrying capacity kind of sliced up in, uh, into different 
orbital zip codes, if you will, or orbital slots. We'll figure out what exactly is the best method. I'm looking forward to discussion about that. And, you know, based on how loaded, you know, how close to orbital carrying capacity we are, we would put higher bounties on objects in those orbital zip codes. And so if we do that and we put together a, a subsidy, a tax subsidy that, um, that really tax credit that, that allows people to fund it, we think that we can get good results. Uh, and it allows us to apples to apples compare large object debris removal ideas and multi-object small debris removal ideas at the same time. And we're, we're excited about the concept and we're looking forward to some discussion. I'm glad Miles is uh, thinking about how to get ADR funded as well. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Yep. So, 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 so with that said, um, we do have a couple of, of questions already. Um, and, uh, you know, this will just kind of be open uh, uh, to wh whomever. Um, let's start with, so Michael Maloney, let's start with him. He basically says there's some debate on when ADR should begin. ESA is working on the first ADR mission for 2025. How long can we delay before starting serious ADR efforts? Anybody want to take that? So I'm, this is Sean. I'm going to say right now, we're ready. <laughs> I think we have to start now. Uh, we're launching constellations all the time. And uh, there's plenty of objects going into space. We've got to start looking at cleaning up and, and taking objects out of space. It's, it's been a long time. And I know a, a long time ago, this problem was looked at. People said it's too risky. It's too expensive. I think we're bringing down the cost of ADR, and I think we're we're taking out some of the risk by having one object go up to remove many objects. Thanks, Sean. Anybody else want to comment on that one? I was curious about the same question. So I tried to look at the literature and see what I could find. Um, work by the NASA Orbital Debris Office about a decade ago said, you know, you're going to see about a quarter increase in objects if you wait. And then ESA has cited internal, but I think not public studies saying something similar. So I think your question becomes both your risk tolerance for what happens if you get something worse than the average case in the models, and then also um, how bad is that increase in the opportunity cost of starting later versus now? Hugh. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marie, but I, I'd like to add that as well. I mean, if the, if the growth of the orbital population is exponential, then we all know when the best time to act actually is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Excellent. Love I'm gonna the say, answer. All right. I'm going to say one Go more ahead. thing. I, if we start now and we start to remove objects, what we're really doing is developing good technologies to continue that work. Um, the removal of objects, the the propagation of debris is never going to stop. So this isn't like, you know, when do we start so we can finish cleaning up space? This is when do we start so that we can have a, an ongoing service for eternity that, that cleans up the, the objects that we're putting into space. Uh, that's a really good point, Sean. Um, there's an idea called persistence. Um, you know, and actually what we're trying to do is just to keep the environment the same. Um, our activities, you know, in terms of ADR, will be just to maintain the status quo. Um, yeah, so it's, um, I think, a really good point to make. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so the next one is actually uh, for you, Hugh. Uh, somebody's asking, what is the uncertainty on the long-term modeling? Why do you display only average of the simulations? How does the model capture the worst case scenarios? Should a discussion of those be included? <laughs> so yeah, take, take it however you'd like. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. So thanks for bringing that up. So, so in the paper, um, I present some results. Uh, there are uncertainty, uncertainties attached to that um, based on our Monte Carlo modeling. Um, but of course, we're making a whole range of assumptions that, that are going into that particular simulation. Um, so th those assumptions are, are particularly weak when it comes to trying to predict what our current launch activity might be, for example, or what the solar activity might look like, how many explosions there might be in the future. Um, so there's a whole raft of things that we have to um, not necessarily guess at, but, but actually state as assumptions. These are our um, uh, settings for our scenario that we're looking at. And then we can, we can draw conclusions 
but in the context of those assumptions we're making. So to directly answer the question, the uncertainties um, are very, very large because we don't know what we're going to be launching in 10 years time or 20 years time. Um, so if we're, if we're making predictions with our models that are out 100, 200, 300 years, then the uncertainties will be uh, very, very large. So actually what we're doing really is, is doing our best to understand what the current level of activity actually represents in terms of things like sustainability. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Uh, Sean, so what are the costs for the US to legislate a Space Debris Act of 2021 to incentivize tax credits for commercial and private financial con contributors to help SSA, STM, ADR? So, you know, what we're looking at is a, a tax credit that would, that would fully fund investments from the private sector. And we think that, you know, while this is a slightly, it's a, it could be a lot of money, depending on how many, how much money people decide to spend in this area. Um, we think that uh, putting limits on it is probably not the best idea, although there has to be some budget. We also think that if you allow the private sector to make decisions about what, um, what projects to fund, you take a, a whole administration cost out of whatever whatever agency is is been trying to do it up until now. Thank, thanks. Um, I'm going to take this one. Uh, part of me wants to answer it, but I'm not you guys, so I'm I'm not uh, gal and gal. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take this. But here it is, right? Um, what do we do about non consensual debris removal? I know it's a tough question and somebody here better have a good answer for it, right? Countries countries that still object to anybody touching their junk, but they're actually, those pieces of junk are actually taking up capacity. They're taking up orbital capacity. And, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, they're basically just like crossing their arms like, oh, well, nobody can touch my stuff. And my piece of junk is taking up capacity that otherwise, you know, an active satellite that some other country might want to put up there could, could be using. Um, what do we do about non-consensual debris removal? If it's debris, if it's debris, we need agreement that it's debris. I, you know, there's been some talk about state secrets being hidden in satellites and other things being hidden in satellites. And I think, you know, we're, we're not harvesting state secrets. We're trying to, to make room uh, and and decrease the, the load on orbital carrying capacity. And we have to agree that junk is junk. Anybody else have an opinion on non-consensual debris removal? I'm just hoping that norms evolve, right? And so if you start with some of the easy stuff, you build comfort, ADR gets to be less scary. I'm hoping that you might see evolution in some of those perceptions over time and that that might help alleviate this in a maybe more gradual manner than a more confrontational approach. Cool. Anybody else going once, going twice? I know this it is. It could be also maybe some exercise of uh, categorization, also on level of uh, legislation and regulatory framework of individual states, where they say, well, there is uh, this category of uh, degree objects, uh, and if, for instance, uh, a state actor that is national of uh, such a country. Uh, applies with a request of uh, sending its satellites uh, or other type of spacecraft into that particular orbital slot, then if uh, since uh, such an object uh, is categorized as space debris, there is need to free up space and the, this uh, nation state uh, or can authorize, uh, for example, a private company to act and remove that uh, piece of debris if there is, even there is no agreement uh, internationally on uh, whether it's touchable or untouchable, for example. No, I, I think that's excellent. And here's here's the thing, right? I can imagine like here on the roads in, in, in the United States, um, if somebody just decided to leave their car on the side of the road, you know, private citizens can't just like go and jump the car and like do whatever, because that's private property, right? But, um, the government does have uh, third party uh, towing trucks that can come and remove the, 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 the car, the debris, right? So I think going, using kind of something like that as a model um, might, 
might be something to look into. But uh, I don't want, like I said, I could have a whole uh, rest of the day conversation on this and, and I'm not going to do that. But no, thank you so much. Here's an interesting question. Um, so are there similarities in the business? Are there similarities in the business cases for ADR and making single use vaccines? If so, should we publicize orbital debris in the same way we publicize emerging disease threats? Yeah, so I think there are two key overlaps. The first is you have some large amount of research and development investment that either needs to be funded or amortized somehow. And that's true across both of these cases and drives the funding model. And then the second is that the laissez-faire market clearing case is going to lead to less of this being consumed as a good or a service than is societally optimal. And so the nice thing about the advanced market commitment is that in return for providing a per dose subsidy or per debris risk reduction quantity, um, you then agree to both make sure a certain capacity is provided as a provider, you, you will be available if people want to purchase it. And then secondly, above the subsidy quantity, you agree to provide subsequent missions at close to your marginal cost of offering the service. So you get to more of the desirable thing being consumed than otherwise. I think from a publicity perspective, we could also learn a lot from that community as well, which is I think another issue that question is getting at as well. Nice. One interesting question here uh, from Mark is, would it be more palatable to government officials to start removing objects that could potentially, you know, re-enter and actually survive re-entry and make it to the Earth's surface. Anybody have any comments or thoughts about that? If I may, I think it's uh, not so much the size of the object, but uh, the ease of the exercise. So if we're making the first step, we better choose uh, a spacecraft uh, over which there is no dispute, the, there is uh, consent, uh, the, everybody agrees that uh, this uh, needs to be done, and uh, moving uh, in such a way will uh, show more like the, the mechanics and uh, the uh, steps uh, of the entire exercise rather than issues related to uh, uh, arguing about whether or not and, and uh, which one and under what circumstances and who can do it. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, going back to this idea of carrying capacity, should there be a satellite limit to, to certain orbits? Let me let, and, and let me let me just say this right and maybe this is a way to kind of even tee it up a little bit better. Um, I have thought about if we can agree to the orbital carrying capacity how it's defined. I've thought about you know in a just like how satellites have to go to the ITU to get spectrum allocated. People before launching would probably have to go to some international organization to get capacity allocated. Um, so so so. That's just a thought that I've had, but but yeah, uh, should there be some way to limit, um, you know, satellites into certain orbital highways? Hi, Maria. I can throw my thoughts in. Um, yeah. So so I think the first thing, of course, is to understand what the carrying capacity might actually be, and to have um, widespread agreement about what that is. I think otherwise, it gets to be a bit difficult to be allocating capacity if you don't have an understanding of quite what the consequences might be if, if it's exceeded or whether you've actually um, uh, articulated it particularly clearly. Um, the, the second um, issue you have is, is that it's quite likely that some orbits have already exceeded a capacity. Um, so then what do you do with those particular orbits? Because we, we're continuing to launch into them um, and they're valuable orbits that, that we're using. So, so you know, you, you kind of have to, I think, unwind that question a little bit and 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 come back really to the fact that we're we're probably overusing the orbital environment already, and that we have to take some steps in addition to understanding what the carrying capacity might actually be. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, completely, and I have some students looking at this capacity stuff, and I'm like, chances are, uh, yeah. 
chances are there are already some orbital highways that we've uh, exceeded that capacity, sadly. Thank you. you. At, Thank you. Yeah. When you look at airports and how we direct air traffic, you know, if we just had people landing on uh, landing in airports from every direction possible, we wouldn't be able to land as many planes. You know, since we don't control direction or path of any satellites that go into place, that carrying capacity is going to be much lower for, a, you know, a random path satellite than for satellites that that follow in a in a line and are highly ordered. You know, just like a laser can carry a, a lot more light in a specific pathway. Um, if we have an ordered group of satellites, they, they take up less uh, carrying capacity. Thanks for that. Uh, here's a question uh, that Islam Hussein poses, uh, I think for Miles. He says, isn't it self-contradictory to say that laissez-faire is unsustainable? Owner operators have a self-interest in safe operations in space to protect their very own interests. So laissez-faire has an incentive in it that works for the benefit of safety. We should leverage that. Um, I don't know, Miles, anybody? Uh, I mean, I, I have opinions about that, but um, yeah. Anybody? So I actually agree completely. And I think for the advanced market commitment idea to work, operators have to have some incentive to purchase missions to remove debris in their orbit. The problem is that the private incentive to an operator is only part of the overall societal benefit. The operator gets only part of the risk reduction that everyone who uses that orbit sees. So what economic modeling in the field tells us is that you're going to see an under purchasing of ADR services by self-interested private actors. And so this helps try and get us closer to the socially optimal quantity by addressing that. Miles, I 100%. I 100% agree. And, you know, when we've talked to individual operators, uh, they're, they're not interested in reducing their risk that way because they're only getting a, a small portion of the benefit from, from ADR. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I say that laissez-faire is unsustainable. So, Me too. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, too many people thinking, you know, the space is very big and all these other things and behaving, you know, quite stupidly. So um, anyway, uh, given all that, uh, in, instead of pushing for another question, um, is there any anything anybody would like to say just to, to kind of wrap things up? If anybody had something that they feel, hey, this is a nugget that I want kind of recorded. Uh, this is what I want to say. Anybody want to do that real quick? I'm very keen to hear Siwoo's comments on any of the questions that we've got, if, if he's got a chance to say something. Yeah, Siwoo, do you want to say something, man? Because you've been the most quiet one here. Actually, I have a question, not the answer. So the question is, as the perspective of the uh, second mover in the space industry, uh, like uh, my country. So in the case of the uh, limiting the capacity of the orbit. So I think there may occur the disadvantages to the second mover. So I want to hear some opinions about some equally, uh, equally distribu distribute the capacity of the orbit. All right, anybody? I'm not touching that one. Uh, Mori, but you, you already, uh, in some of your remarks, uh, made the parallel with ITU. And we all know that uh, ITU uh, activities uh, are underpinned by hu huge complexity in terms of, you know, how you allocate to who, priorities, etc., coverage. Uh, and I think that any kind of uh, allocation of uh, orbital space uh, will will necessarily be a complex uh, uh, undertaking that will have uh, quite an elaborate um, uh, set of rules uh, and uh, the decision making process. Thank you for that, Catherine. Uh, anybody else? We got. A minute left before the break. 
Yeah, I just want to pick up on, on that point, really. If you look at the three pillars of sustainability, um, one of them is directly addressing the comment that Siwu really made, you know, um, things, solutions have to be equitable. Um, I think that's a really important thing to remember when we all try and drive towards this sustainable future. Um, and if we are, or somehow end up allocating um, space as a resource, then, then we have to remember that. Beautifully said, beautifully said. If we look at space as a resource and we look at the constellations that are trying to provide internet to the planet um, and they're launched by the US, are they, are they the US taking up that capacity? Or is this, you know, some, should it be put in some different bucket? No, I, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's fair to state. Anyway, I want to thank every and each uh, of you uh, for being on this uh, uh, session. It was really great, very informative. Looks like it generated a lot, lots of questions, uh, more than we could actually get to. Um, I will uh, also encourage folks who have not done so already to go and, and, and look at uh, the presentations uh, you know, uploaded and made by, by each one of the, the uh, five participants. So Catherine, Siwu, Hugh, Miles, Sean, thank you very much. And we're going to take a quick break. And in nine minutes, we'll be back for our second roundtable, which will be about international uh, perspectives. So, uh, and we'll, we'll be, uh, that, which will be led by uh, the really awesome uh, Regina uh, Pelza. So nine minutes, be back here. And thank you very much. <laughs>